I'm here somewhere. Call the meeting to order at 6.04. And so, um, if we could have a roll call. Lines. Committee members Edgerton. Here. Wolf. Oliver. Here. Hutchison. Here. Lovelace. Here. Gabrielle. Hintermeister. Here. Okay, and report of the chair. I did attend the joint meeting of the, uh, or it was an implementation board meeting, or it was a, actually it was both in uh, December and there was nothing really novel or new and so I won't have a report on that but in other items um, thank you folks for putting the members on the front and but if we could also get a an email for um, Mr. Sullivan so people can contact you and also there may be somewhere in here, but I don't see a phone number either. Uh, just to make it, you know, easy for, you know, easier for folks to contact you. And also maybe even the, and probably the, uh, the website address. Uh, so that's the end of my report. And uh, the advisory committee member announcements, notes, or however you'd like to do it. If we could start with Jan over here to my left. Excuse me. Do you have anything that, that uh, you want to bring before the, the body? Okay. Joe? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, yeah, actually, I do. Uh, my first. Um, I wanted to ask Mr. Sullivan if um, he was going to report on the Northern California Habitat Conservation Planning Workshop. I didn't go. I was sick. So. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I couldn't okay. remember. You know, it's, it's November. Okay. It's like seems so yeah, far away. It, it was a long time ago. Um, I am I, unfortunately I rushed out of the office and I didn't bring my notes from it, so I just uh, brought the agenda just to let folks know what went on. Um, it, it was very good. I wish I brought my notes uh, because there was a lot of interesting conversation. There always is. Um, but uh, just to let you know that um, the, the agenda items were using science to detect species trends in response to a changing environment, wetland restoration, histori history, ecology, and community. Um, that's always really actually very fascinating stuff. Uh, funding conservation plan implementation. Uh, federal, state, and local, uh, the economic benefits of HCPs, and um, lessons learned from uh, regional conservation plans. The other thing I wanted to mention was, um, it's just a, on a personal note, I had the opportunity to hike San Bruno Mountain um, about a week ago. Um, San Bruno Mountain is the first HCP um, that ever was, and they have um, their own butterfly issues, uh, the endangered uh, mission blue butterfly. Uh, and it was really interesting to listen to their take on an HCP because of how it was written then. They, they really sort of broke the ice and so there's a lot of lessons from that HCP learned. Um, you know, they had a, a nearby hill, I forgot the, the name escapes me, that was uh, prime. Um, uh, habitat for the endangered uh, mission blue uh, that they lost to development because it wasn't part of the original package. Um, so that's, you know, we're, we're really fortunate, I think, um, being where we are uh, in terms of the lessons learned and, and the HCP we have now. So just wanted to mention that. Okay, can I comment on that right quick, Julie? Uh, <clears throat> this is just a side piece of information, but I think most of you are aware that the bay checker spot butterfly on, that we have here on Coyote Ridge is one of the covered species. They're trying to reintroduce that to uh, where you, what was San Bruno. San Bruno Mountain. The problem is there's no Plantago erecta there. So what, uh, what uh, I did along with Stu Weiss and some others of us last week, we took the Plantago that does appear on San Bruno down to some of the bay checker spots and see if they would eat it. And they munched it like crazy. So they're going to do a reintroduction of the Bay Checker Spot on San Bruno Mountain, which wasn't in the initial plan, but that's really a cool thing because uh, 
It's expand, expanding their territory into a place that they didn't think would do. But now they found out that uh, we got video of them munching this different plantago. It's related, but not the same. So anyway, it was new information that kind of ties into that. Yeah, that's really interesting. Dick and Kyle, anything uh, for the good of the, the group? No. All right, Craig. <laughs> All right, Fine. getting away easy. Sure, lines. Yes. Okay, um, Julie reminded me of something. You know, I went to the um, California Native Plant Conference that was uh, a couple weeks ago, and it, I've never been to one of these, and if you ever have a chance, I would really recommend it because it, it was really very fun. Um, even though I'm not really a plant person, don't really know that much about plants, uh, they covered all kinds of uh, restoration uh, kind of concepts, uh, a lot of stuff that would really be of general interest to anybody. Uh, in particular, they had a, a bunch of um, a bunch of uh, sessions on restoration and kind of related activities. Um, one was on that I didn't get a chance to go to was just um, kind of lessons learned from uh, San Bruno HCP. But the other thing that was really interesting that's kind of relevant to us was uh, there were two different uh, reports. Um, by biologists uh, working for the water district on coyote ceanothus. And in particular, one of the, one of the biologists, Janelle Hillman, um, just kind of casually at the end of her talk, actually had some nice things to say about working on a project that was involving the HCP. Cool. And then it kind of gave them uh, the opportunity to do some proper planning for reintroduction of coyote ceanothus. So apparently they're doing some take um, during the um, uh, retro, seismic retrofit of Anderson Dam. So they're taking some coyote ceanothus from there um, to somewhere in Kirby Canyon or somewhere else in Coyote Ridge. And um, apparently they had a failed effort because of some root rot. I mean, I don't know all the details. So they'll be redoing that. But um, actually it was a very interesting story, uh, just the the initial uh, uh, transplantation that they did with Coyote Cenothus, kind of the lessons I learned from that, and then their continued plans, and some nice things to see about Seda Devon and HCP. So I, my personal thought was that, that would be a, if, if she was interested, that would be a good story to kind of pass around a little bit, or even uh, you know have people, uh, have her maybe give a talk somewhere in this forum or somewhere else, because it's, it's just a really interesting story. Uh, it's locally relevant and kind of relevant to the HCP. I, I could ask her about coming here to speak about botany in general and working with the HCP. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Then moving on to public comments for items not on the agenda and one more request. You know, if, if you could just reword a little bit, the length of public comments may be limited by the chair. I would suggest with the concurrence of the other members that we just may want to say three minutes or uh, to me that's the general that I've seen and, and I think rather than in a people tailor their comments to three minutes we'll just be able to uh, if they can't say it in three minutes well then let's be on the agenda is, is that satisfactory with that? okay so three minutes on that one so are there any public comments for the items not on the agenda and thank you very much for the shout out at the last meeting. They bypassed my little spot on the agenda. <laughs> yes. Okay. For the public advisory committee action, regular business, item number one, selection of 2015 public advisory committee chair and vice chair. Edmund, would you like to lead on that? No, nothing other than it's uh, the, the two other boards that are Brown Act boards also recently just re reappointed and selected. Well, the governing board uh, reappointed both the chair and, and uh, vice chair, the uh, Wasserman and Tucker. And then uh, Wasserman will continue to serve as the chair of the implementation board and uh, dist uh, water district uh, Director Lazat will be uh, acting as uh, vice chair, taking the place of Brian Schmidt. Who lost the election. Uh, okay, and so then it, opening the chair for either nominations, motions, or uh, who 
do, who does the, the members of the board wish to be uh, the chair for and chair and vice chair or just one or the other? Can we have a motion that we keep the existing situation as we have it? Yes. So moved. Okay, call for the question. Call. Uh, aye. 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 All right, thank you. So, so, so selected. Thank you all. And, and Chairman, uh, just to um, let you know, Georgia Treffs Garfink resigned from the board effective today. Okay. okay. Or I should say the PAC, the committee. Yep. And Liz was appointed? Yes. And so we're just waiting for her to put it on her calendar? Yes. I, I reminded her about this date. Um, I'll, I'll send her the, all the meeting dates. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And then uh, uh, if we, uh, the next item, number two, approve the minutes of the November 6th regular meeting. Could have a motion and a second. Motion to approve. Second. And uh, all those in favor, aye. 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 Thank you. Item number three, California Association of Environmental Professional Awards recommended uh, action. Uh, this does not uh, require any action and it's informational item only. This is fairly significant. It is. So you, you want to tell us about it? And yes, I some? don't. I, I'm not familiar with this particular award, uh, but it is the third award that the plan has received in the last, uh, I think, two and a half years. So this is uh, a group, uh, as you noted, the Association of Environmental Pro Professionals, and the plan itself was awarded the Outstanding Document uh, Award. And the conference is in uh, Santa Barbara towards the end of March, I think March 22nd through 25th. So it's quite an achievement. Um, it's, it's a credit to all the people that were involved in putting the plan together, the, the municipalities, the environmental community, the development community, uh, the water district, the VTA, and, and everyone else that was involved, the wildlife agencies, that everyone came together and were able to reach a compromise. And, and that allowed this plan to uh, be approved and we're all here today because of that effort. So it was nice to see that some organization, a statewide organization recognized that. Yeah. And will someone from the agency um, or one of the, the board members be able to attend? I'm, I'm planning okay. on attending. Um, I notified all the, you know, the PAC members and the two boards. If, so if anyone wants to attend, let me know. Um, I know there's a, we, we talked about it today with this informal uh, meeting group called the Implementation Committee of the, the cities and all the co-permittees to get together and talk about issues, about plan implementation. And we were talking about coordinating efforts to go down there. There's a video uh, presentation that goes along with the, the award ceremony, from what I understand. So we'll try to get some electeds and whoever else uh, would would like to participate with in, in that effort. But it was truly a group effort to get that, um, uh, to get this plan done. And yeah, I think whoever w would like to participate either in the video event or um, go down to the conference and, and be part of the um, award ceremony, uh, we'd be glad to have you. Thank you. And uh, do any of the members have any comments about the award? After seven years of work, that's the least they could do for us. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I took outstanding to be the highest award that this group does give out. <laughs> All right. So hearing, oh, did you have some? Yeah, I attended the conference last year, and the work they do with HCP is significant. It, um, they spend a lot of effort and energy uh, talking about HCPs, and we even played a round of HCP Jeopardy, which I really enjoyed. <laughs> but the meeting is worthwhile. Um, Aside from the award, I think the award is a great achievement, and I'm mm -hmm. happy to see it bestowed upon us. And the meeting is, it's a very good meeting. So uh, I hope someone goes. Good. Thank you. All right. Number four, AB 1600 Development Impact Fee Report, fiscal year 2013-14. 
and we are to review this, and that is uh, an Edmund uh, game, I think. Yes. So uh, one of the requirements of uh, state law is that an organization that collects uh, development fees, that there's a nexus between the development fees and how the money is spent. And one of the requirements of this law, also known as the Mitigation Fee Act, is that every year we do a report on monies collected and money spent by the agency. So not all the money we collect is AB 1600 uh, related, and I'll go over that in, um, in detail. So um, AB 1600 requires any jurisdiction imposing development fees must report the following, a brief description of the type of fee in each account or fund which for us, that's burrowing owl, land cover, serpentine, nitrogen deposition, wetlands, so forth and so on. Um, the amount of the fee, uh, the beginning and ending balance of the account or fund, and the amount of the fees collected and the interest earned. So AB 1600 revenues for the, for the agency uh, in fiscal year 13-14, was um, so we're it's it's a little bit behind in how this process works even though we're in fiscal year 1415 this is a report on the previous fiscal year uh, we're three hundred ten thousand six hundred fifty two dollars non AB uh, 1600 revenues were six hundred and forty dollars uh, or six hundred and forty thousand one hundred and sixty dollars and the, the AB 1600 report balance was a negative 394,575. Now you're asking, well, why was it a, a negative? Because it, it only looks at AB 1600 fees. So those fees that we were collected, uh, you know, the $640,000 were, were, were not factored into the AB 1600 calculus. Um, after so this there was a negative balance after the agency expenses of seven hundred and five thousand dollars four hundred or, or seven hundred and five thousand dollars four hundred and nine so um, the summary of uh, agency receipts and expenses is on page 16 of your packet and I can go over this with you and then the next page page 17 shows you all the revenues that we got, both AB 1600 and non-AB 1600. That'll help explain some of the numbers. So as you can see on page 16, it kind of lays out uh, land cover fees and wetland mitigation fees that were collected last fiscal year. And then it lays out all the agency expenses in the last fiscal year. And the expenses were greater than the, the amount of AB 1600 fees collected. but. But overall, the, the agency was in the black last year by, um, I think, around $250,000 by the end of the fiscal year, the amount of money that was rolled over into this fiscal year. And um, that's the end of my report on that, if, if there's any, any questions. questions. So what is it about those fees that make them non-AB 1600? Uh, What's the distinction? Well, there some of the fees collected by the agency were cons were related to uh, there were some grants that the agency received. There was some monies that were yeah there uh, there were some monies uh, that were given by the water district to the agency, sort of like startup funding. There was also um, uh, projects that. We, we call them voluntary contributions. So the, um, the amount of money that was um, contributed to the agency was a result of CEQA in a lot of cases, the CEQA mitigation requirements, or in some cases, um, letters written by environmental groups or um, wildlife agencies highlighting uh, like we got a check this year from the Apple Corporation for nitrogen deposition for nearly $130,000. They're outside the plan area, but there were letters that were written saying your project and Apple agreed to 
mitigate the effects of, uh, of uh, nitrogen uh, and it wouldn't be counting as AB 1600. So, so those are some examples. But um, those are all things that, that really are, were not fees collected right, by. Right, and, and any money we would get from foundations or, or gifts or anything like that would also not be considered, yeah. Thanks. And that means that those funds can be expended without any nexus to the group that paid the money. Uh, they, they can be uh, spent um, with more flexibility, but our intent is to spend them if they were to be used. Uh, if somebody was writing us a check for burrowing owls and, and there was the city of Morgan Hill had a burrowing owl, uh, Richard, as you're aware of, they had a burrowing owl uh, local ordinance where they collected fees. Those monies will be spent on growing out. The monies that Apple and others have given us will be spent on management of the serpentine grasslands. So the growing out monies will be spent for uh, managing, uh, trying to enhance the growing out populations. They they won't necessarily be used for um, uh, land acquisitions, it, at least in those two cases. But if we got foundation monies of uh, uh, or grants, we're, we're hoping the majority of that will be used for land acquisition or, or restoration projects. Yeah. You raised a question, Ed, uh, at least in my mind. Is, is there any effort being made so Morgan Hill isn't double collected? So they're collecting a fee for burning out, and mm -hmm. we're collecting a fee for burning out. And yes. it's a duplicate fee, which doesn't seem right to the development community. Are we making any efforts to rectify that? Um, I've talked to the city about that, and it ha it's some, somehow related to the settlement agreement with uh, some of the environmental community, and they're updating, updating their general plan. I would uh, talk to uh, sort of the city manager and, and probably the director of um, development services, and because that's the determination they made. I wasn't involved with it. I wasn't asked. It was a local government decision, independent of the agency. Yeah. Other? Yes. Um, just a, questions of curiosity here. So, um, County of Santa Clara, the planning department, um, land cover fees, were, were these just uh, something in the pipeline or I just want, wanted to sort of get clarification on that. Sure, it, which, which uh, are you talking about page 17? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at page 17, yeah. Okay, and you're wondering about um, County of Santa Clara? Yeah. Oh, that... yeah, no, those are wetland mitigation fees. Okay. So the land cover fees are not paid because they're doing land in lieu, so they're, they're enrolling um, nearly 13,000 acres of county parkland okay. as mitigation for the, to offset their, their land cover fees. There's no offset currently for wetland uh, waters fees. Yeah. So that's why you see that. Okay. Yep. Um, and I see uh, Gavilan College three times uh, the campus modernization. Is that for Gilroy? Correct. And um, one of them is not part of AB 1600? It's, How yeah, that's, uh, that's that, uh, we, we have a surcharge, I'm, I'm assuming, well, we have, we have three fees on PS, uh, participating special entities. Mm. One is this uh, pay to play, because all the partners put up money and staff time to put the plan together. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, the, and this fee process was, uh, established before I came on board. Oops. Uh -oh. Nobody's moving. <laughs> <laughs> we're helping with wave our arms. Yes, they didn't like my question. Yeah, yeah that, <laughs> I think that's what it was. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Quick thinking, I want you in the lifeboat. So. <laughs> like this, it was the same kind of thing. <laughs> so, uh, so we have these uh, uh, application processing fees for PSEs. We have okay. this pay to play, I think Ken called it a surcharge, and then there's the actual land cover fees that they pay. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that's how it's all, uh, why, why it's described that way. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, and I was just curious about the first American title company. What was, because that's quite the fee. Yes, that is. That, that's a Morgan Hill project. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, it's sort of that voluntary contribution um, where they paid through uh, some negotiation with the city through CEQA. Don't know all the ins and outs of it, um, but I can, I can find out if you want to know more. Yeah. It was a question of curiosity. Yeah. I'm not complaining about getting the money. I'm just. No, I'm not either. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, I do have one question in 2013-14. Uh, so why so late? Or is there? I just think it's sort of the reporting process for um, for the AB 1600 process. I'm I'm new to this, so right. yeah. So I think um, you you do the reporting the beginning of you know the new the new year. So you close out the fiscal year, maybe, and, and this is the way it was established for this agency to do it. Others may do the reporting sooner than that. I don't know. So this was calendar year, not fiscal year? Uh, it, it's reflective of the fiscal year. So it would have been from July 1st. I don't think the agency was quite in existence yet, but July 1st of 2013 to June 30th of 2014. And that's, and that's what all this reflects. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Uh, can we, sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, can we go to page 18? Um, I, I'm, yes. I wouldn't mind a little clarification on some of the, the categories. Sure. A little nebulous to me. Sure. Um, so uh, one of them is under technical and permitting support, um, information management. Could you just qualify that a little bit more? Yes, I'm. I'm assuming that has to do with the establishment of the geo browser and the web page. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It, it may have to do with some of the uh, buying of computers, and uh, the city of Morgan Hill is our IT support, so probably covers some of that. Uh, the county of uh, Santa Clara does our GIS work for us. So I, th I, I didn't get into the weeds on that number, but I'm, I'm assuming that's what it, uh, it represents. And the uh, covered activities um, plan review assistance, um, is that the consultants looking? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, that, uh, that would be ICF. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Okay, do we have any comments from the public on this item number four? Hearing none, we'll move on to item five. Review fiscal year 2015-16 development fee adjustments. And I think that's you again, Ed. Correct. So the plan calls for um, automatic inflation uh, adjust, uh, adjustments to the plan's development fees. There was an ordinance adopting the development fees uh, that they would incorporate this annual adjustment. Uh, the ordinance was in 2013. Uh, as noted in the attached urban economics report, the three fees that fund land acquisition increased by five point, will increase by 5.7%. Um, we're changing the ordinance date to July 1st from June 1st to be more in alignment with the fiscal year calendar of state and local government. That hasn't, there's a song and dance you go through to change an ordinance, so it takes several months. <laughs> so um, once it's adopted by the governing board, the, the new date will be July 1st. So the, the fee increases will uh, occur, be effective July 1st. And, uh, and the wetland and burrowing owl fees increased by, will increase by 3.6% from fiscal year uh, 15 levels. In fiscal year 14, the fees that fund land, land acquisitions increased by over 9%, and the other fees um, increased by nearly 10%. So these, uh, these fees are not quite as high uh, of an increase as what happened in the previous year. Uh, fee increases also apply to participating special entities. 
uh, indices used to justify fee increases were the house price index and the consumer price index. And um, the new development fee schedules is attached to the staff report and it's exhibit A. So we went to the governing board for the approval. These are automatic fee increases, but uh, we felt since, um, and they're administrated by nature, but we felt that given the, the newness of the agency, it would be advisable to have the governing board approve the fees by resolution. And as part of um, your duties, um, is to review and comment. Exactly. Okay. Great. So can the adjustments be down? Um, in theory, possibly. I've never heard of, of that happening. I think the, it, there, or there could be no fee increase. I, I, I'm pretty sure they, they'll never go down, but I can, I can check into that. But I, uh, but I do know there, there, there is the possibility that they wouldn't go up based on. Because the, I, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm glad to see revenue is going up for yeah. the agency. That, that's great. But the CPI wasn't even close to that. Uh, and the housing index, yeah, we went through a bounce from a bust a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm just wondering how they come up with something like that. And if we go through another downturn, which there's a likelihood we might someday, yes. uh, 30, 40 percent, which we saw a few years back. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that then what would probably happen is there would just be no increase. It would stay the same. Correct. Um, oh, usually, for us. usually fee, some, sometimes uh, I know when I was in Placer County, certain fees <laughs> were waived for development projects or uh, during the downturn, there was they were usually minor in nature, but typically, and Richard would know this better than all of us, that fees usually, when they go up, they don't come down. Um, but I can I can look into that. Um, it's a it's a good question. Yeah, one of the problems I'm having, of course, is that we have a, a fee without representation. In other words, we're creating fees on landowners, people who own land, and, and they have no clue that this fee is going up. And so we're really taxation. We're taxing without any kind of representation. Those people say, yeah, we ought to do it. And that troubles me a bit. Mm -hmm. I think and when I see right now, we're about where we were in the height of 2007 in the housing market. So we're raising the fee based upon a return to normality. And that to me is not correct. Because if, you know, if what we're doing is, is tacking on fees and pretty soon we just kind of get used to those fees going up and, and at, at some point then we have a, some rebelling by the landowners, the farmers, the people who own the land and say, hey, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. so, so I think we need to be sure that we have a, an accountability of the justification for fee increases before we just blindly do it. I don't, that's not what on our peer view of, of this committee, but at least I think you need to take that input back and say, at least there, I know that the people in the development community are, are kind of saying what's going on. Understood. Thank you. In, in, in that same line, does this go to the implementation board or the governing board, whichever one it is, mm -hmm. before it goes up? Well, the, the ordinance, we, we did it this year. Right. But uh, the ordinance was written, which was approved by the automatic. Automatic. I, it was approved by that. it was approved by the governing board back in 2013. Okay, but then yeah. as as a not a landowner, but but as a the, I'm just looking for the right of it, and so I would think it would need to go to them um, before, so that if someone does want to complain or praise or do whatever, mm -hmm. then that could be heard, and then the, uh, I'm guessing that the uh, the board could. Um, decide not to do a full increase as the mechanism or, or not true uh, yes I it, it's a bit of a conundrum because the board adopted an ordinance that leads to automatic increases the, it, it the, sort of the power was taking away from them we uh, we returned a little bit of power to them this time which if they had uh, 
turned down the increase, it would have been an interesting conundrum because they are an automatic increase based on, um, it's like the automatic COLAs going up for Social Security or uh, let's say uh, some uh, em employee contract wages are increased through CPI. That's kind of what's happening here is that this ordinance uh, leads to an automatic increase based on, and in Santa Clara County, land prices are, I mean, I moved from upstate New York to Sacramento, Grass Valley, Sacramento area, and housing prices doubled from upstate New York to that area. When I moved from Sacramento to here, house prices doubled again. So part of, part of what's going on here is that we have probably one of the hottest real estate markets in the country and these, and these fees are um, reflecting that increase because we, we take money, right or wrong, from the development community and people who want to do something, um, they, you know, convert their land from whatever to uh, housing or commercial development. And then we have to turn around that and, and go out and buy land for conservation. So if we didn't keep pace, we would not be able to buy land over time. So that's, so that's the rationale. I'm, I'm not defending it. I'm just explaining it. I'm not asking for yeah. any d defense yeah. or justification, yeah. but just so that the board has to make a conscience, mm -hmm. conscious decision to, that they are, in fact, raising the fees. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, they're accountable. Yes. And, and you were at the, the meeting and you remember what uh, Supervisor Wasserman said that the, the intent was to do these little increases over time. Than being right. hit with a, right. in the face by a right. speeding truck. But I, I understand the concern that are expressed by the committee members here. Yeah. And by saying it's automatic, is it automatic because of the, the, the provision of HCP? Where, wherein is that automatic provision? How does, who, who changes that or who installed it? Oh, it was the, the governing board adopted, a re, adopted the resolution. So it wasn't anything that, I wasn't here at the time, but it wasn't anything that Ken was insisting upon. But, yeah. That, that board then could change that at some future time. Technically, yes. Yeah. Technically, yes. Yes. And you know, is there any indication that the land that we would be buying or have been buying Mm -hmm. Is increasing in the same extent that land that is available for development is increasing? Yeah, I think Kyle would have a better handle on that than uh, uh, and Craig than I would. Um, we we haven't acquired any land yet, but it's it what what we're talking about here is primarily uh, uh, ranch land and farmland and some land that's undeveloped. Uh, you know, it's owned by. Craig was telling me about some property today that's owned by a private corporation. So there's so it's 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 either owned and not being developed, or it's owned and it's being used for farming or ranching, and and those have inherent value. You know, ranching and farming has an inherent economic value, but it's it's usually a lower value. Not always, but it's usually a lower value than uh, land for rooftops or um, or high commercial value. Let's say in Mountain View. So I think they would have a better handle on, you know, how how the price of land is going up. If Kyle wanted to buy some more uh, land to graze his cattle, or Craig wanted to buy some land to uh, purchase, uh, I've been knocking on doors, but no one's offered me their land yet. <laughs> I, actually, I I do have a comment on that because. The, the situation we're up against and everybody in the conservation community is uh, competing with the development community for the, the, that land. And so we look at, um, just use an, an example that doesn't directly apply necessarily, but Coyote Valley, where the agricultural value of that land might be $20,000 an acre, where the development value of it is 100 to 150 on the low end. So, there is a relationship between as the development value goes up and there's more pressure on that, even the conservation value goes up because of the competition there for, for that land. So it, it's, um, it's, it's a conundrum and we're all trying to find land to preserve and it's really difficult because everybody's holding out for development. So there is a direct relationship there.
I'd like to also add that one of the goals of this uh, HCP is to put together a continuous piece of land uh, that enriches the habitat uh, and preserves Coyote Valley specific plan was going to take a big chunk of that. Hopefully that's been held off. And so the idea that there's a lot of land that is valuable uh, that could go either way. And hopefully we have enough funds and resources to secure that land for uh, the preserve. Yeah, thank you. I'll put my two cents in. Kyle's not looking for land to buy because that's not realistic to graze and pay off land and compete with HCP, Fishing Game, and Co. Park because they, they knock it out of the park on prices. But we, I think we need to focus on if we do purchase land, we hold the development rights and then turn it over so that someone can ranch or farm on that. And that would be the, the strategy that I've been talking about ever. And, and also like blocking moves. So if there is a lot of land going up to the foothills, if you buy certain pieces that blocks the, the growth up to the hills and stuff like that, that would be the strategy I would hope that we would go after. So, and you could also piece it together with parks and, and ranch lands because the ranch lands, you have someone on there that has their life invested into it instead of a park where the guy's there from nine to five and once he's off the clock, that's it. And who knows what's going on afterwards. So. No, thank you, <clears throat> Julie. Uh, yeah, I just have a question of clarification, all that heated discussion. I just wanted to know. Um, I'm, if I'm understanding these two sheets right, we're one says land cover development fees. The other one is the development fee schedule. They're both one and the same. It's just one is the, the year prior, correct? Correct. <laughs> okay. So can I find out why um, on uh, this one, on zone C, it says small vacant sites between 0.5 and 10 acres, and everything henceforth says two acres between uh, two and 10 acres versus 0 0.5, so half an acre. Page are you referring to? So I'm on page 15. Okay. Um, and then after, thereafter, we're on page 22, and, and, and like I said, following, I see always the two acres. So I just wanted. The, yeah, that's just uh, an abbreviated uh, schedule, the one that's. Part of, no. So, but again, yeah. why does it, there's, there's a difference, right? So on zone C is, oh, yeah. you see it's between so it half an acre and, and here it starts at two acres. So I'm just looking for the clarification. Okay. You know, I can't ex explain the differential. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, I can tell you that the, the new one is correct. I don't know why it's two acres. Yes. Yeah, that's what yeah. I thought. But yeah. I just want him. Hey, if I'm am I it, wrong? It was a good wrong. catch. <laughs> okay. You uh, you guys are more thorough and <laughs> investigative. <laughs> Keep me on my toes here. Thank you. Other, Jay. Um, if you guys are done talking about that particular thing, I yeah, think so. I, I had a different question. I I kind of learned something uh, that I didn't uh, understand or didn't know about with respect to the Bur Berwyn owl fees. Mm -hmm. Um, so I noticed in both um, the uh, item four and five um, that the burrow and owl fee um, does not go towards purchasing land. Okay, it's for it says for management only, or, or you know, I'm not sure what the exact wording is. But on the other hand, the plan commits to buying, or, well, excuse me, to having under fee title or conservation easement. Um, a minimum of 600 acres of land. So I would have thought that the borough and owl fee would have you know, gone towards the purchase of that land. So could you explain what seems, seems con it was confusing to me. Yes, yes, uh, a big part, well, a big part of the burrowing owl strategy is managing existing populations of burrowing owls in lands that are already under conservation. Uh, whether it's in Fremont with Warm Springs unit of Don Edwards or it's the outside of the sewage treatment and landfill area in the city of San Jose 
or the city of Sunnyvale, Mountain View, Palo Alto potentially. So those, those communities and those uh, entities need dollars to help manage and enhance the burrowing owl population. Uh, it's, it's the conundrum that, that we face that the owls are all in North County and suitable habitats in South County and there's, and there's no birds. So the last uh, population, there was some pop, a small population here in Morgan Hill. It's, it's been um, absent from this area for I, you know, a couple decades, I believe. So, um, so the plan came up with this kind of uh, extraordinary uh, approach that I don't think any other plan, any other HCP is attempting to sort of manage and enhance the population with the hope that as the population expands in North County, the birds will expand, leave, leave that area and, and through connectivity or translocation or whatever strategies employed that they will uh, start coming down to South County where uh, the larger reserve system is envisioned. Uh, the 600 acres, some of that was a vision to be uh, acquired in um, North County. And uh, there's talk with the city about some of their land maybe being enrolled in the reserve system. Nothing, nothing concrete, but there's definitely talks with them about that. Um, uh, I'm sorry, at which city? Sorry, uh, City of San Jose, okay. sorry. So some of that voluntary contribution monies could be used for acquisition potentially. You know, there's a little more flexibility. Um, but given the price of the land in North San Jose, don't know. So we, we have commented on City of Santa Clara projects that will have a, a potentially adverse impact on burrowing owls. and. If you do the math, when you look at Centennial Gateway and um, City Place, that if 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 we are able to um, get them to mitigate for burrowing owl uh, impacts through their CEQA process, then that could really help with some land acquisitions potentially up in that part of the world. Um, but yeah, this uh, this is this is going to be a very difficult strategy to implement. But what, and, but, and, but and, that's, and that's why you see the heavy the heavy hit on management, and and there's another heavy one on serpentine. Yeah. So I, I think I understand that, but really what we are saying though is that those burrow and owl fees are really meant uh, to manage land which may be owned by somebody else, like in the case of that Warm Springs Correct. on the refuge. Um, but when we look at that, when we look then at the plan's commitment to purchase through fee title or conservation easement like 600 acres as part of a as part of burrowing owl habitat mm -hmm. that really comes out of kind of the habitat plan general fund yes or yes however, the land cover that the land cover and also foundation monies or grants yes okay yes okay yes thanks other questions comments uh, along that line, uh, just so I'm clear, because um, in our annual surveys of the Bay Spot Butterfly, uh, we have found seven new locations of burrowing owls on Coyote Ridge. So what you said was to manage what is there so mm -hmm. that hopefully they will expand in the future. Mm -hmm. There seems to be some evidence that they might be expanding. We do know that the... the, the uh, they were nesting up in the Altamont Pass, which is a high valley. And there's some thought that they, there's, because nobody's been out to Coyote Ridge and surveyed them to see if they are out there in the summertime. Mm -hmm. Is there funding in there available that if they were shown to be uh, nesting there, uh, say we found juveniles, mm -hmm. would there then be funds to purchase some lands up there or to be more than just reserve, uh, preserve what's there? Yes. the the UTC Coyote Ridge property uh, will be the 1881, 1881 acres will be enrolled in the reserve system. And w I have approached uh, the Pratt and Whitney UTC company about acquiring the balance of the property. 
and there is the potential for burrowing owls to be there. Uh, there was a report from the consultants that work for UTC that there was a, a fledgling seen out there. Uh, we haven't been able to confirm that. I think a lot of the birds that have been seen in that area are w overwintering, but well, they're not. But they're. I. I we, we don't know that. Yet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a speculation. It's a speculation. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm. Um, I'm hoping that that's not the case, and that some of them are breeding there. It. It would. It. It would help with our ability to uh, meet the goals and objectives of the burrowing owl strategy if that were the case. Other questions? I have one other. The uh, we received uh, mitigation fee from Apple for from outside the area that's mm -hmm. coming this way. So how is that noticed, or is there a process that the agency is looking at to look for things like that? Yes, we've written letters to all the not participating cities, uh, letting them know that they can't claim that they're mitigating their nitrogen deposition impacts. The plan is not mitigating their impacts. The plan is mitigating the impacts of activities within the plan area. And that 27% uh, of the nitrogen that's deposited in the grassland and oak woodlands of, of this county, of this plan area, come from the non-participating cities. Um, only 27%? Only 27%. The 50-something uh, percent comes from development with that it is existing or will be. So the majority is still within the plan area. And then it, the others coming from who knows where. It could be coming from China, I, I assume, <laughs> or uh, San Francisco. But um, that's, that's sort of the... The rash. So yes, we have written letters, um, and we also wrote a letter Fremont because they have burrowing owls, and um, we get um, development notices from some of the communities. Some are choosing to ignore us. <laughs> it came up as you remember, Walt, at the and, and the board was asking me some of the same questions. Uh, the implementation board members. And I said, well, we've written letters. Uh, we've written, uh, I mean, letters to all the all these cities saying, hey, hello, we're here. Here are our issues. We've written comment letters on um, uh, specific development projects. And as I posed to the implementation board, if if they want more to be done, it 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 would involve legal action because. Um, Mountain View is taking this position that our plan mitigates their impacts, and they don't need to pay anything. What? Yes, that's one of the reasons I brought up Whoa. the question. So, so I mean, I, so, I so, think so we have a legal hammer, right? But we don't know if how strong that hammer might well, be. Well, yeah, I, I only have so much authority and so much time. Right. Yes. <laughs> so, um, it it would be a, a board decision if. If, if, if they want to join Audubon and Sierra Club and California Fish and Wildlife to, uh, to sue these communities for um, not adequately mitigating their impacts because they affect our ability to, to achieve our conservation goals and objectives. Um, I was, I, and I, I expressed this to the city of San Jose, I was disappointed that they did not write a comment letter on the city place development which is uh, city of San Jose was pretty vocal in uh, their concern about the competitiveness of communities within the plan area with these extra fees that they didn't think it was fair. Nitrogen was one of them, Burrowing Owl was one of them. Um, so we wrote letters, um, uh, the state wrote letters uh, sort of in response to San Jose's concerns, and I, I expressed to San Jose that you need to write letters too. So we're we're in this as as a team effort, and uh, these these impacts are cross jurisdictional boundaries. The plan area is, is a jurisdictional boundary, but um, so to speak. But the impacts like air pollution, water pollution. Uh, 
do and, and affecting the, uh, the sustainability of the burrowing owl population is uh, they, don't, they don't recognize plan area or jurisdictional boundaries. So it's, it really is up to, I would say, conservation partners, the, the participating cities, and, and how, they, how aggressive they want to be in commenting on these projects and whether our board wants to pursue legal action. And, and I would defer to the board, and, uh, and I take my, my marching orders from the board. I, I would do that. Yeah. Julie? May we have a copy of the letter? Yes, I, 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 can, um, I can send you some copies of the letters. I'd appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. Okay. Others? Oh, um, just wanted to make one comment toward um, Greg. You, uh, Craig, you had said you know, that you were surprised. Um, but it, it's kind of reminiscent, at least for me, uh, about a month or so ago when um, the, the Gilroy City Council did not vote to be included into the Open Space Authority and one of the comments from the council member was, why should we? You guys are doing the job all around us. Why should we pay for it? Same kind of attitude. Offline, uh, there's a story about that. Right? Oh, I, I know part <laughs> of it. I know part of it. But to make that public comment. Well, in, in that... Has a, that's not a, a dead issue yet. No, but it is dead for a little while. Yes, yes. As a resident of Gilroy. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any other? One last time. All right. Going on to item number five review fiscal year 2015 16 development fee adjustments. Ed, you're up again. Oh, yeah. I, item six, right? Five or six? Is it five or six? Do I have the wrong number on my on my no. thing here? Or is it five? No, we just did number five. Yep. All right. So now we're on number six. Okay. Review approved update FY fourteen fifteen budget. Okay. Thank you. Can you reference a page on that? It just helped me out. I got it online here. Twenty nine. Twenty nine. Thank you. <clears throat> so um, revenues to date are nearly 2.8 million I, I won't get it to the exact dollar unless you want me to so but i i would turn your attention to page 30 and projected revenues um, and anticipated revenues so in the first column it's at the top of the, the page on page 30 uh, fees were anticipated to be Six million in land cover, zero in serpentine, fifty-four hundred in or five point four million in um, burrowing owl, nearly four hundred thousand in nitrogen, three hundred in wetlands. Uh, PSE entry fees, uh, three ten, and grant funds two million. And anticipated. Uh, is projected to be 3.7 in, in land cover, 1 million in serpentine. There's a couple projects, Communication Hill and potentially a San, a San Jose Water Company project that lead me to make that uh, $1 million anticipated revenue. I'm, I'm assuming, um, you know, Ken didn't have the luxury of meeting with KB homes like I did so uh, you could view um, the 3.7 and the one is sort of reflective of the six um, burrowing owl fees are going to be a lot less than was anticipated probably around two million and that includes uh, monies from City of Morgan Hill and the water district which is also a voluntary contribution for their um, water purification plant. And so the majority of that money is coming from those two projects, or those two sort of non-plan related collection. And then uh, there's a, a, a San Jose project, the first phase of which will probably make up the balance of that. Uh, nitrogen deposition 
it's hard to say what that'll be. Um, uh, the city of San Jose subsidized, chose to uh, use economic development funds to subsidize the nitrogen fees on a lot of projects in certain areas of the city. So I don't know when we'll be collecting those fees, but this is just a guesstimate of what we, we think. It could be a lot higher than that. Uh, wetland impacts, they've been very minimal to date. 100,000 might be a, a bit of a higher projection on my part. And then the participating special entity fees, that's primarily um, Caltrans Ferguson Road project. They're, even though it already has a BO, they're, they're going to uh, biological opinion through um, the CEQA NEPA process. They are um, going to mitigate impacts to salamanders and red-legged frogs through the plan. So they will be um, mitigating their impacts through our plan, even though they already have a, a, a BO and the project's been completed. <laughs> um, and then um, the grant funds, the differential is um, the $2 million uh, that was originally projected is is the section six grant that OSA got. So the land will be in for Coyote Ridge. So the land will be enrolled in the reserve system, but we can't put the, the grant in, in our budget because right? we didn't receive it. Uh, OSA got it. So it should have never been there. So that's why there's that big, big differential there. So anticipated revenues are uh, projected to be if these projects come in before June 30th, are are projected to be seven point roughly 7.3 million. Uh, projected back uh, over um, uh, back in June was 14.385 million. So there's a big differential. And um, I think some of that is a result of pipeline projects. I don't think too much of it was. Some of it is development is not happening as quickly in the city of San Jose as was anticipated. Um, there's been a couple projects in Gilroy that paid nearly $2 million in, in land cover fees and other associated fees um, late last year. So um, I, I think uh, the, the numbers are high because of that grant being in there and, and in my opinion it shouldn't be in there and since we didn't get it and uh, probably an over ambitious estimation on the burrowing owl fees that would be collected from the city of uh, San Jose. So that's why there's the, the differential there. So we uh, alerted the, the board to the discrepancies and um, so I'll just continue. So expenditures to date are $677,000, just slightly more than that. Um, one other thing in, in the, the original budget was a, a capital expenditures, which were projected to be uh, of 11, uh, roughly 11.2 million. Um, we don't, we're, we're not in the business of capital expenditures. I, it, it, it's not that it won't happen. We, you know, we could buy equipment, we could build a bridge on reserve system lands. So I, I wouldn't say that capital expenditures won't happen. We, we're, we're in the business of acquiring land. So it's, it's asset management and asset accounting. And, and, and with our new accounting system that we're setting up, we'll, we, we will categorize land acquisitions accordingly as, um, as you know, revenues going to um, a land asset, and that and that's how we'll be managing it. So it was probably not knowing how to classify that, but we're we have a CPA uh, on board helping us creating um, uh, a tracking and an accounting system, and we're going to be um, having um, uh, software to um, be able to run reports and 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 so I. I think in the future you'll uh, you'll see more of a probably more accounting accuracy. Yeah, more accuracy and an accounting process that you in the business world would be 
used to or in the nonprofit world. So um, anticipated um, fiscal year 15 expenses, uh, expenditures are approximately 1.7 million, which is 520,000 less than the budgeted amount of 2.21 million. So um, some good news, we won't be spending as much money as we thought, but we're, our, our revenue projections are about a half of what they were <laughs> anticipated to be, so. Questions? Going once, going twice, okay. Any comments from the public? Hearing none, we can move on to Fiscal year 2015-16 budget schedule. Yeah, and it's just sort of to give you an idea of, of, of what we're going to uh, go through. We're, we're starting to meet with the co-permittees to get a sense on their projections where, where possible a five-year projection, but certainly from the land use uh, agencies, try to at least get a one or two-year projection on what they think revenues will be based on entitlements and uh, sort of the land process, the land use processing system. Um, there will be a budget workshop and you guys will all be invited on May 21st at 1.30. It'll be just before the implementation board meeting. So if you can make it, that would be great. And we'll get into more details about what the budget will look like and what were some of the accomplishments of the agency over the past uh, past year. Ed, would you repeat that date again? Uh, May 21st at 1.30. Well, where look, where's the location? It, it'll be here, yes. Yeah. It, it'll either be in this room or in uh, the West Conference room. So. Then, um, any questions, comments? Okay, the, on the agenda, I didn't see an item for report from the executive officer. Yes, but I'm gonna, uh, so I'm gonna, you, I'm gonna give you some update too, if you'd like, yeah. Yes, please, yes. And, but where should that go for next time? Oh, it would go after everything else. Okay, yeah. fine. Yeah, I didn't think I was gonna report on anything, and then I said, no, oh, there's a lot. something always there, comes up. There's a lot I need to tell you. So I mentioned the Ferguson Road um, um, participating special entity agreement with Caltrans. We're also doing a very small one with PG&E, but it's, it's the beginning of getting both those organizations comfortable with using our, our process. And, and one thing when I met with KB Homes, um, they, they said, so we just write a check and no more games, and I said, Yes, you just write a check and there's no more games. Well, ask them for the tip. <laughs> yes. And so I, I think at least for uh, a large developer like KB Homes, the, the plan works. It, the, the back and forth that they went through before, uh, which I think was more process oriented than outcome oriented, uh, it, at least for them, this is a better deal they there's it creates certainty they they know up front it helps them with their capital financing uh, for the the smaller developer um, uh, you know Richard could address that uh, better and and I think we need to get some more business representation in the light of Georgia uh, leaving the board so and it's working for Caltrans and pg and e so so we'll um, hopefully it'll over the long over the 50 year stretch here it'll work for everybody including the the farmers and the environmental community um edmund yes what is the pg e project it's uh it's it's not far from tulare hill it's just a pipeline maintenance the amount of fees they're going to pay are like under 300 dollars <laughs> oh goodness <laughs> yeah it's just a small footprint um and it's it it it's a good way to sort of build a bridge with another partner. They they have um, 
a lot of requirements to mitigate for red-legged frog and tiger salamander, and there might be opportunities to buy some properties with them jointly. And they, to answer Kyle's concern, uh, ranching and grazing is a big part of the success, but the long-term success of the plan for, for fuels management and uh, definitely serpentine management for you know for the butterflies and the plants yeah here's a, <laughs> here's a question i yes i know a piece of property that just sold that had an easement from the open space were you aware of that property uh, being sold oh, oh from osa no yes. i was not aware of that at all no yeah. well actually two pieces of salachi salachi's ranch but the uh Kenyatta states Road. yeah the, the state parks own that easement they have another piece of property that was on Bloomfield that sold, that OSA had an easement on. So, oh, so OSA sold the properties. Well, no. Uh, the, oh, 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 the, the uh, Salachi sold the property, and and there's easements, the easements on them. On yeah, it, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, um, interesting. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. So no one's. No. Okay. No. And you just gave the example, KB Homes. What's the size of the project? Where is it located? What was the fee they paid? It's um, with, they're projecting uh, the fees will be paid in April or May, um, and they it's the Communication Hill development. Yeah, so there's four phases to that project, and it would be the first phase of that project, and they just did some calculations that they thought what the fees would be, and it was. Um, uh, 1.8 million yeah how many homes all together? oh I couldn't I couldn't tell you that it was it was more based on um, acres yeah how yeah many, how many acres were involved I I could I could share that information yeah it uh, the big reason why the fees were high was serpentine soils were being impacted so and that's uh, a project that we will be seeing um, uh, coming before, uh, you know, coming, you know, we'll be seeing the fees on that relatively soon, from what I understand. But it was nice to hear that, that at least for one um, organization, they they like the plan. I'm I'm sure others don't, and and, and I understand that. Yeah. On on the one stop shopping center thought. Um, are we we're still nowhere or just where are we with Army Corps of Engineers um, from what I was told the other day they're taking a year to the San Francisco office to even process a restoration project so you need a permit to let's say restore a wetland or a stream channel um, we're we're going to elevate pressure on them because it's it's important that we get that RGP because this is where it, it would help a small developer or a small landowner that they would have a streamlined uh, 404 process for half acre impacts or less. Um, we're uh, we're going to put a lot of pressure on them unless certain things change, and that means meeting with the higher ups within the organization and also um, getting electeds involved both at the federal and local level to make calls to um, they're very unfortunately they're very responsive to that yes yes and, and i mean and besides zoe lofgren there are many other who i would classify as friendly from this particular area and and i would uh, uh being new to the area i would certainly be interested in talking to you about that um, I'll, I'll probably work through the county too and their um, lobbyists and advocates and see and I would bet the water district has a lobbyist too they they do yep and and I th so it'll have to be when we get to that point a coordinated strategy for sure okay any more for your report yeah, just real quick, we're, um, Caltrans is going to be donating a, a property uh, off of 152 to the agency. It's um, Pacheco Creek. It was a mitigation site that they having trouble managing, and, and they're, they're going to pay management costs for that and an endowment. And so we, we aren't just accepting land as a gift. We want money to help us manage the land. And, and they've at least 
tacitly agreed to all that. And their, um, um, what is it, land right away group, the right away group approved the, the donation. So at least that legal hurdle was, now we got to work out an agreement with them. It's, it's an important piece of property because it, uh, it allows for connectivity under 152. So it's right over by Pacheco Creek. And, um, is that there or just below the dam? Uh, below the root? Yeah. On the north yeah. side of 152? That yes. Area? Yes. It is just below that, that, that private, private dam. dam. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if, when and if that is, is settled, can we get an actual report on that? Absolutely. A more detailed yeah. one? Yeah. Thank you. No, I'll keep you up on all the ongoings with that. So public land enrollment, I mentioned it earlier. So uh, Calero Park, the state park, and Coyote Valley, the OSA property, are will be enrolled in the reserve system. And then uh, Santa Teresa and um, Coyote Ridge will be the, the next two properties enrolled after that. And Calero Reservoir does have a little, little bit of water in it now. I, I know. I, I saw that. I was out there couple weeks ago Ho hopefully this next rainstorm will help too if we get it maybe i missed it you said calero state park no i, I uh, missed that no a county park if i said state i misspoke okay so, okay yeah. i was wondering if there's a new park i didn't know about <laughs> <laughs> and so these are just existing parks that it, it's that land in lieu with which is available to the private sector too there's a private land in lieu program also so uh, we're collaborating with PG&E on acquiring properties. Um, uh, I've met with all the conservation organizations in the region to discuss land acquisition and collaboration. I've met with some private landowners and I've talked to others. Uh, that so far, just talk. Um, Next steps is to hire a realtor to assist the agency with finding willing sellers. And uh, we also, one of the requirements of the plan is um, that it's not just mitigation monies that pay for um, the, the reserve system. So we'll be meeting with those, some of the local foundations, the Hewlett, the Packard, the Moore, uh, all of them. But like Craig said, there's a lot of competition out there with TNC and Post and 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 others who um, they they uh, we we all have the same goal and we all want to succeed but you know we all have our marching orders too so um, one of the big things we'll be doing is beginning the section six grant, grant process and there's some properties we we hope will will be eligible to apply for those funds. And that's a federal grant program to acquire land. And you only can do it if you're HCP, NCCP. So um, I met with the California Rangeland Trusts and, and looking into partnership. Uh, I met with some of their board members and, um, and Nancy Schaefer. And uh, I think we had a, a, an excellent meeting last Friday about shared ideas and, and hopefully there'll be some partnership opportunities for doing some uh, re outreach to the ranching community and and maybe even working collaboratively on some easement agreements um, the problem with us is so much of our money right now is mitigation money and so um the foundation money will be critical to sort of commingling gifts and other grants and we're participating in that um, Santa Clara Valley Water District regional um, update of their region. Oh, well, I guess it's their new integrated regional watershed management planning process. It's quite a lively, uh, <laughs> pro yes, biggest stakeholder group process I've ever been involved with. <laughs> Welcome to Santa Clara. Yeah, and, uh, and that's all I have to report. Thank you. Ed, can I just respond to your question? few months ago uh, in comparison to KB and their experience with you. As a small developer, we have uh, been working along with Gallon College, to whom we sold a good chunk of our property in Hollister area, San Benito mm -hmm. County. We're in about our sixth or seventh year with fish and game and 
U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and uh, over a million dollars, and aren't even close to solving the, the mitigation of what, what they want. And so, you know, you, you take a certainty which we pro provided for developers. So I, I think, and that's why I supported the plan, and I think it's uh, good. I just wish I had some land in here that I could take advantage of it, but. I think it worked well, and KV is a good example of that, and I think uh, most of us in the development community support it because of the certainty that we have and the, the fee. And, uh, I think it's the time that we, we save, which is the critical part. Thank you. Okay, thank thank you. you for that comment. Okay. Hearing? Great. I, I did have one, uh, one thing to add. I, I don't Do you have any tours planned on Coyote Ridge coming up? Have you talked with Stu? Yes. Not, uh, I, Jill, Jill's going to, uh, my, my assistant is, is, is going to contact Stu and also OSA. And I mentioned to Jill today, let's get that going and that the PAC members be invited to that. Yep. Okay, because just for the, the board, uh, I've been leading tours up there for a number of years uh, as a hike, but some people don't necessarily want to walk up. And so I think they're trying to arrange a day where people can drive up there okay. and see things for those who don't want to. So maybe we should have Jill call you too. Uh, call me, yeah, because yeah. I, work, I work with OSA and, and do a lot of that. But okay. uh, with the rains coming this weekend, what we had in December, this should be our best wildflower year we've had in a long time. So it should be a really good year. Huh? <laughs> Maybe we should have a donation to the Land Four Conservancy <laughs> per foot. Per person. Yeah. You got me per foot. Oh, yeah, let's go with that. Okay, then uh, our next meeting will be May 7th here. And the next meeting of the implementation and the governing board will be? It's, uh, Angie, I know it's March. What is it? 19th, I think. that third Thursday whatever that is yeah yeah okay and those are at uh, three o'clock correct okay and, and it, uh, it'll be another joint meeting of the two boards yeah. and that makes it's, it's efficient yeah agreed. Yeah. okay so um, any one last call then uh, let's uh, adjourn 726 and I will note that that is our earliest ever <laughs> excellent <laughs> Bring more stuff, Ed. We don't I, have enough I, stuff to I know, I know. <laughs> so seriously, Craig, is, is it your projections are on what you think you're going to get for rain? Because, I mean, we got it on January. Good day to take so. off. Well, this weekend we're expecting yeah, yeah, two to four inches. Yeah.